Hi, can you see the screen? Great. So uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm Max, and as mentioned, I will be speaking about uh, time series forecasting, and uh, particularly uh, open source uh, time series forecasting. I'm here on behalf of uh, my team and my other co-founders. We are a startup that is trying to help uh, the machine learning ecosystem by developing state-of-the-art open source libraries. So Kin and Christian and Federico, all of them have a background in economics and, and mathematics. And Kin and Christian have been researching time series forecasting at CMU for quite a while. Part, part of the things that we are going to be presenting here are results of the research that we have been uh, doing. So uh, today, the outline that we're going to be following is uh, uh, what you see on the screen. First, we're going to be speaking about time series in general. Why is it important? What, what, what is it? Then we're going to be focusing on the application of deep learning models, state-of-the-art deep learning models that we have uh, developed and made available to the public particularly uh, the n bits x and the n hits. And afterwards, we're going to be speaking about more classical models, uh, namely statistical econometric models for time series analysis. At the end of the presentation, we're going to briefly go over uh, some work in progress that we have, hopefully to ignite some curiosity and maybe even to ask you to collaborate in, in the project. So. What is, what is time series forecasting? Time series forecasting, as you probably know, is uh, the task that aims to predict future observations of a target uh, variable based on uh, information of the past and exogenous variables. So there are many, many applications, and time series is really ubiquitous in the sense that everything that changes over time or all data sources that have a timestamp are at the end of the day time series. But classical applications are, for example, healthcare, where you try to predict COVID outbursts in specific uh, uh, zip codes to allocate the uh, necessary medical personnel and medical supplies. Another very beautiful example is uh, electricity demand forecasting, where you uh, try to forecast either the price or the demand of electricity in the grid. And this is very important because, as you know, the, the grid is one of those systems that needs to be in constant equilibrium. If you produce more electricity than you consume, then you have to do something with that electricity. It's not that easy. And if you produce less, then you have a, 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 a blackouts in, in cities. A other very classical examples that we have been working a lot with is uh, how to predict demand. Uh, demand forecasting of, uh, for example, goods or SKUs in e-commerce and, and retailers. And recently, uh, with new technological uh, developments, IoT time series forecasting is also a big thing. Imagine trying to forecast millions and millions of different sensors or devices uh, across, across a factory, for example. So formally speaking, uh, uh, time series can be represented as a multivariate regression problem where you're trying to predict the, the future or, or the predicted variable using uh, the past autoregressive historic uh, uh, data, but also uh, exogenous variables, future and, and static uh, ones. So there are two paradigms, and this slide is very important, and at the end of the day, we're going to be speaking about this slide during the whole time. There are two, two schools of thoughts uh, in time series analysis. The field was developed and, and, and researched mainly in the past by statistician, uh, statisticians and econometricians who developed very interesting autoregressive uh, models like ARIMA, linear regression, exponential smoothing. And then recently, uh, uh, obviously, we also saw a revolution of machine learning in the field with uh, decision trees that have uh, performed quite well in different competitions, but also support vector machines, uh, nearest neighbors, ETC. And more recently, we have seen um, a growing interest in neural networks, deep neural networks, and in general, in uh, deep learning for time series forecasting. Uh, the advantages of, of using deep learning, the justification for, for trying to explore and expand the field with these uh, new techniques is that they offer higher accuracy. 
these models are very uh, smart, one could say, in understanding complicated relationships between the different series and the data and the exogenous variables. So we are seeing improved accuracy uh, with these models. But we're also seeing a simplification of the forecasting pipelines due to the fact that one doesn't have to spend as much time uh, doing feature engineering and, and, and in general data wrangling as, as with other, other techniques. And then since uh, with deep learning models, you are uh, trying to uh, understand all series at once and not individually like autoregressive models, this also, or the usage of deep learning, also implies uh, scalability in this uh, pipeline. So that reduces or translates to uh, very fast uh, systems that obviously can be run in, in GPU. So with the uh, newer uh, availability of larger data sets, we have seen that uh, deep learning has grown a lot in popularity uh, becoming a valuable and, 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 and general uh, forecasting uh, methodology. Deep learning has also performed quite well in, in, in benchmarking competitions, in time series competitions, in the, in the M4, M5, ETC. However, uh, although neural networks are indeed powerful and flexible, they are not really that easy to understand, and they are not that really <laughs> they are not really interpretable, and and that obviously poses a difficulty if you're trying to make important decisions based on the model that you have. So there is this constant uh, tension between being able to accurately forecast, but also understand more or less what the model is is doing, and that's where the end bit comes in place. That's one of the that's the first model that we're gonna be. Uh, speaking about today, and the NBITS X, which is our model, built upon a great model developed by uh, the people of Element AI, uh, Joshua Benjo, Boris Oreshkin, uh, who developed the NBITS. And, and the NBITS aligns itself in the tradition of the left cluster that we saw at the beginning, the left, left word cloud, namely the economic tradition of signal decomposition. So we are trying to decompose uh, the series and, and the forecast, not, not only in, like, in the values, but in certain uh, components, namely trend and seasonality. And this has been done uh, by many financial institutions, central banks across the world, and, and, and that decomposition actually is it's, it's very interesting in terms of understanding more or less what's happening with the, with the model. So what the NBITS does is it takes that econometric tradition and uh, empowers it through the uh, use of uh, neural networks. And then what we did is we put the X to the NBITS, namely we created the NBITS X, uh, which is the inclusion of exogenous variables. So as you could uh, imagine, uh, exogenous variables like weather, calendar variables, uh, market uh, data, ETC, uh, is very important uh, in forecasting. So we are trying to expand that uh, great model by including exogenous uh, variables. So the, motivation, the, the contributions that we are making to the field is we are building upon this noble time series uh, decomposition method that renders explainability. And we are also including combinational, combinational encoders to uh, model the behavior or the impact of those exogenous variables. At the end, we test this uh, model with different uh, benchmark data sets, and we are able to achieve state-of-the-art performance on, on electricity price data. Uh, the models, again, are available for everyone to use, so, so you can test them in your own data. So the architecture is we have this neural uh, network uh, with different uh, uh, multi-layer uh, perceptron, and, and those layers are going to decompose uh, the signal, are going to decompose the, the data that we have in three blocks. So we are going to have a trend block where we're going to approximate the signal using a polynomial function. Then we have a decisionality block, which, as you can imagine, is, is, is an harmonic series. So we're going to approximate that with, with, with harmonic series. And then finally, we're using these combinational encoders to explain the impact of the exogenous variables. And we tested this uh, model, uh, as you can uh, read in the, in the paper, uh, with different uh, data, electricity market data from five different countries. And we were able to uh, achieve very good results. So these models uh, improve 20% over the original NBITS implementation and are even uh, better than certain specialized electricity price forecasting uh, models. Uh, uh, but again, uh, we're not only gaining performance and accuracy, we're also uh, gaining the possibility of having an interpretable decomposition. Uh, if you see the signal, this is the actual price of the electricity of, of I think, friends. And then you can see the trend component of that series. 
you can see a decisionality component. And in our case, you can also see how the exogenous variables uh, add up to the, to the original signal. So here, it is, this last row of the graph shows the, the residuals. And as you can see in the right side of the graph, the exogenous variables actually reduce the residuals and, and make uh, the signal uh, better. The second model that we're going to be talking about today is uh, the NHITS. And the NHITS is uh, doing uh, something called hierarchical interpolation for time series forecasting. And we were uh, trying to solve or address one big topic in the field, namely how to do long horizon predictions. So long horizon predictions are, are hard because you are uh, constantly confronted between the famous bias uh, variance uh, problem. Namely, you can use econometric models that tend to have very high bias. That means they are very prone to, to error. Or try to use machine learning methods that uh, high, ha have high variance. So they might explain the data better, but they are also very prone to overfitting and, and volatility. And uh, uh, they also come with high computational uh, costs. So to, to further explain what's happening here, the choice that uh, one had to make before the end hits, if you use uh, classical autoregressive models, what you are trying to, to do is forecast the horizon based on your prediction. So you are forecasting the second uh, time step using the first one, and the third using the second and the first one. And that tends, uh, uh, that sequential sort of prediction uh, concatenates the, the errors and, and renders very unfortunate uh, results for long horizons. So imagine you are trying to forecast, I don't know, 900 horizons in the future, you are going to end up with a huge uh, uh, error. The alternative is doing multi-step predictions. That is, instead of uh, forecasting sequentially, you try to forecast the whole horizon. And that tends to be better in terms of accuracy, and, and some machine learning models do, do it, but it's computationally very expensive because we have to forecast the whole series. So what you end up deciding is either a very, a very high variance or high bias uh, uh, model. This is what you just, we're, we're just explaining, but in, in graphical terms. And uh, you can see how this behaves in, in actual data. Like uh, on the left side, uh, you have on the x-axis the horizon, so from zero to 1,000 time steps in the future. And in the y-axis, you have the performance uh, degradation in a logarithmic scale. So as you can see, the further the horizon that you try the forecast with a classical model, with the red line, the higher the error. And, and this is growing very, very fast. So, so, so probably this uh, classical models would not be a good fit to do long time uh, horizon forecasting. And the same thing happens with uh, the number of parameters that the model needs. They grow exponentially with the horizon, which uh, uh, tends up, uh, ends up being very expensive in terms of memory and in terms of uh, uh, speed. So the solution that we came up with is the, the NHITS. And the NHITS, what, what it's doing is it's, it's, it's sampling uh, the information. So we have different uh, uh, frequencies. And the model is learning the different frequencies. But it's not forecasting the whole uh, point, but different distances across the points, making it uh, a lot uh, easier for the model to learn. So this, this is what we're doing. It's called a multi-rate signal sampling. And then we do hierarchical interpolation between those points. And at the end, we aggregate uh, those predictions, those different layers of predictions, into the final uh, prediction or into the, the signal. This is going to become clearer, hopefully, with the, with the next graph. So what the model is doing is every layer is learning a different frequency. So at the beginning, we start with a very long distance between the, the points. And this uh, could be understood as a low frequency uh, signal uh, modeling. Then we start uh, shortening the distance between the points, and the frequency starts uh, growing. And if we keep doing this, we are going to end up with uh, different layers. Every layer of the network is learning a different frequency. And uh, for you uh, in the audience with a, with a mathematical background, this is, at the end of the day, an extension of uh, the very famous Fourier transform, where you could 
add or you end up adding different harmonic signals into the uh, different harmonic frequencies into the signal that you want to model. We actually uh, show how you can perfectly reconstruct with the end hits uh, a latent harmonic signal using uh, the synthetic data. And at the end of the day, what you're seeing is how the stacks add up to the to the to the actual signal, or the signal being the the actual data that you want to to model and, and forecast. We didn't want to keep this merely theoretical, so we uh, tested this model on different data sets, electricity again, exchange rates, and even some uh, highway traffic here of the, of the Bay Area. And uh, here you can see, see the results, or probably you can't see the results, but there, you, there, there are the results, and, and if you're interested, we can share the presentation later. And again, we see a, a massive improvement in performance, namely 25% improvements over other state-of-the-art models of the uh, transformer-based uh, uh, architectures. Uh, we outperform one of the best uh, awarded uh, papers of AAAI uh, of, of last year. And what's very interesting is that this model is outperforming competitors and is also reducing the uh, computational uh, time. So it's 50 times faster than some transformer-based methods. Again, because it uses a lot less parameters, it's a sparse model, which is, which is great, no? if you don't want to spend a lot of money or time in your, in your forecasting. So if we come back to the graph that we were seeing at the, at the beginning, uh, here, the, the end hits is the blue line at the bottom. As you can see, the line is quite stable. It doesn't grow as fast as, as the other one. And in terms of memory and speed, same. Uh, we, don't, we, don't, we don't have an explosion of parameters in the model, which, which uh, translates to, to faster computational speed. Here, you can see the comparison of the end hits uh, in in terms of computational speed with other uh, former uh, uh, models, like the autoformer, informer, transformer. On the, on the y-axis, you have computational time in log scale, log 10 scale. So as you can see, it's, it's, this implementation is orders of magnitude faster than, than existing um, alternatives. And uh, as an extra bonus, and, and I think this, this is one of the, of the things that we were trying to do, you also have an interpretable forecast. Namely, if you see the, the left is, is the end hit. If you see the, the right, you have a, 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 non, uh, 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 a model that doesn't learn the frequencies. On the signal that we're trying to predict here is, is uh, the heat of, of a transformer, and an actual like, trend, the machine that transforms energy. And uh, you can see that the stack one, stack two, stack three is, the model is actually learning different uh, frequencies. The first one could be interpreted as strength, a very low frequency uh, uh, signal, and then the other one's higher and higher, and then you add up those uh, 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 different predictions and the interpolation of those to actually reconstruct the signal, or to put it in other words, to be able to forecast accurately uh, long-term horizons. Uh, we made this uh, Google Collab for you, so you can uh, go there and, and train your own end hits. You can uh, reproduce the results that we are showing you here, but you could also uh, train with your own data. So we tried to make it very easy for everyone to just go into the Collab, change step two, where we are loading the data, and, and you can start using this uh, model in your own uh, uh, data sets. And, and as far as they are not super big, you can also do it for free using the, the Google Collab infrastructure, even with GPUs. This, this all uh, is part of, of, of our library, of our neural forecasting library, which is available at github.com slash nixlab slash neural forecast. And here we have different things. We have the end hits, uh, we have the end bits X, we have the end bits. We also have some transformer-based methods. Uh, so you can, you can play around with it, you can start it if you like it. And recently, <coughs> we also released uh, two interesting things. Namely, one implementation where the whole hyperparameters are selected for you. So it's a, a way of, of, of doing automated ML for time series forecasting. You can check it out in the repo. And recently, we also released a multi-quantile end hits, which means you can do a probabilistic forecasting and not only point forecasting, which is quite exciting for certain use cases to be able to forecast the probability of the outcomes or the distribution, I mean, of the outcomes instead of just one point. Uh, 
So going back to, to, the, to the word cloud, we talked a lot about uh, the right side and how we are trying to build bridges between the right and, and the left uh, cloud. Uh, but given our backgrounds, we also wanted uh, to develop state-of-the-art implementations of very classical models. And, and that's what we have been creating over the last uh, couple of, of, of months, this Nixlaverse, laverse uh, where we are trying to, to help the field uh, uh, with, with, with these implementations. And we have uh, also machine learning uh, classical models, decision trees in the ML forecast package. But we are going to spend some time talking about this stats forecast uh, library. This statistical forecasting library, what, what's trying to do is develop a really fast implementations of classical econometric models like uh, ARIMA, exponential smoothing, ETC. And we, what we did is we went and, and took, uh, translated some code from, from, from a very famous ARIMA implementation in R by, by one of the leaders of the, of the field that is called uh, Rob Heinemann. And we ported it to Python and we used Numba and we got uh, incredible results. So it's, it's, it's like 50 times faster than the, than the other ARIMA implementations. It's, it's distributable. So we have this uh, joint uh, blog post with, with the people from, 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 from any scale or from Ray. Uh, how we, in, in which we show how you can forecast more than one million time series in under 30 minutes uh, with an autorima in a distributed uh, cluster. We actually uh, uh, have examples there in the, in the repository so you can replicate them. It's, it's, quite, it's quite nice. And if you go in the repo and, and search through the different experiments, uh, we have nice things that might be interesting for you. So one of the things that we are very... Uh, uh, insistent upon is doing benchmarking. So we generated this benchmark at scale, again, using distributed computing with Ray, where you can uh, fit uh, a lot of benchmarks like Croston, Cisol and Naive, Adida, ETC, in, 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 in really uh, fast time. So you can, you can do uh, this like seven, eight benchmarks for 10 million series in under 45 minutes and paying less than $20 in, in, in infrastructure, in AWS infrastructure. We also have this example where we show how a classical econometric model, namely Autorima, is very often faster and more accurate than Facebook Profit or Meta Profit now, which is important because it's one of the most used libraries. And what we did is we benchmarked more than 100,000 series and show that you can improve 70% in accuracy and gain like 37 times uh, more, more, more speed uh, by using a very classical model instead of a, a, a Bayesian approach. So this is, this is important because it translates to, to actual money and time. So if you would be using profit, you would be 70% less accurate and you would be paying uh, for this experiment, 100,000 series, almost $300 in infrastructure. If you used um, an Autorima, an econometric model, it would be more accurate and you would be paying just $10. So this obviously adds up on, on time. So one important uh, thing for us is don't always go for like the most popular libraries. Sometimes simpler is better. Sometimes uh, what we did in the 60s with, with Autorimas is still uh, better than, than many fancy things out there, including, including obviously deep learning models. So finally, uh, what we're working on, some, some teasers, hopefully, hopefully you're interested. One of the most exciting ideas that we have encountered in the field is applying transfer learning for time series. Uh, as you know, this has been quite successful in computer vision, natural language processing, and the intuition is to pre-train a model on a specific data set and then use that model on new data that the model has never seen. So we're talking about a zero shot uh, inference that if, if it works would uh, provide very cheap uh, inference and very fast, very low latency inference. We uh, built this demo for you. You can upload your own data sets or public data sets and benchmark them against different uh, pre-trained models that we have. We have hourly, weekly, uh, yearly models. So, so go and play with it. The other thing that we are working on, uh, and this, this we think is quite exciting, is a low latency API for uh, developers. So there are a lot of libraries out there uh, that are trying to, to help uh, with time series forecasting. There is, uh, and we are big, big fans of them. There is uh, Darts by Unit 8. There is uh, also PyCaret, which is also speaking at the conference, and, and other examples. 
The problem with those, including Nixlab, is that they are aimed at people who write Python and who have some knowledge of uh, data science. What we're trying to do here is democratize uh, time series forecasting for every developer or engineer that might be interested in implementing forecasting in their own applications. And we're doing this with this REST API where you can just send a JSON with the timestamps and the value and get a very fast uh, forecast. And you can do it in Python, in Ruby, in Shell, in Node, whatever you want. So, so this, this is exciting. This is also exciting for people who want to do online uh, inferences without like establishing a whole forecasting pipeline. So if you're interested in this, go, go to, the, to the QR or contact us and, and, and we're still like beta testing this, happy to, to get some feedback of, of, of people. Coming soon, we're gonna be releasing a hierarchical forecasting library that helps uh, aggregate uh, coherently the, the forecast, which is very important for specific use cases. Imagine you are trying to forecast at an SKU or product level, and then at a channel level, and then at a country level. And if those forecasts don't add up, you end up having <laughs> supply chain uh, difficulty. So, so uh, uh, the coherent hierarchical aggregation, it's, it's important for the field. We're, we're working on that. We are also offering, uh, as, as a startup, at the end of the day, we have to make money somehow. And we are uh, also offering this platform that helps uh, deploy forecasting pipelines in, in minutes. It's an end-to-end -end, uh, time series forecasting deployment solution. If you or your companies are interested, we're also happy to, to explore that with you. If you have any questions, uh, please join our Slack community or follow us on GitHub or on Twitter. And uh, uh, we want to thank the open source contributors. We wouldn't be here without them. It's, 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 we have encountered a lot of, of, of love from the community, and that, that's, that's always very helpful for us, uh, being, being an open source uh, project. Some bonus material that, that's important for us, some, some condensed experience over the years. When doing time series forecasting, or probably when doing machine learning in general, be always very mindful of what you read on different blog posts. The, the fancy things are not always the better things. Always, always use strong baselines before forecasting. We have encountered so many use cases where companies spent uh, months and thousands or thousands and thousands of dollars when a simple like Arima or Croston would have been better. So always do <laughs> baselines. Quick and easy results is, are sometimes misleading. Don't, don't fool yourselves. Do the work. Sometimes a little bit of work it pays off. Simpler models are sometimes better. Remember Occam's razor always. And as a final corollary, Facebook profit might be many things, but it's definitely not a model for forecasting time series at scale. Uh, thank you very much, and hopefully I can answer some questions. So we have a few minutes for questions, so if somebody have any question? Just raise your hand. Thank you for the presentation. So uh, my question is on the neural network models that you presented earlier. Um, is there like a data size requirement? So sometimes I know that neural network tends to, um, you need a lot of data for it to work kind of uh, nicely. So does it also work with um, more limited amount of data? Yeah, that's, that's um, an interesting question. The question was if, if the data restrictions uh, apply to deep learning models. And the simple, the simple answer is yes, obviously. The, the, the more data you have, the better the model is going to perform. But again, it's, it's an empirical thing. One, one of the things that we believe is there is no like uh, silver bullet in time series forecasting. So you have to actually benchmark and see which models perform better. But as a general intuition, the more data, the, the better the model is going to perform or the better the computational gains are gonna like, render your, your thing useful. Hi, uh, my name's Christian. Great presentation, thank, thank you very you. much. Um, I actually have lots of questions, but the most interesting one is, how do you deal with non-stationary data, and particularly you know, when you have regime changes? So uh, I think you know, ARIMA models are a great start, and I think they're completely underappreciated. Um, but the problem is that they're obviously linear and that they can't deal with those type of uh, data. And so in my experience, what you always have to do is recalibrate the ARIMA model every, you know, whatever frequency, and then you get pretty good results. But what you're implicitly doing is 
you're assuming every time that a regime change has taken place and you haven't analyzed that or detected it. So how can neural networks help you do that? Yeah, that's, that's a, a great question. And I think one of the important things to consider in time series forecasting is that at the end of the day, it's trying to use the past and certain exogenous variables to forecast the future. So it's, it's, it's not a crystal ball. It, it, so at the end of the day, uh, human intuitions, uh, knowledge, expertise is important. That being said, the advantages of certain deep learning models is that they are sometimes able to understand these like, uh, uh, changes, these structural changes. So uh, some of the people here have been working with pre-COVID and post-COVID data, and, and certain neural networks are quite efficient at understanding that certain things changed. Obviously, uh, you can also like try to generate some dummy variables, pre-COVID, post-COVID, and probably an, an Arima would, would fit that. But again, it's, it's the time series forecasting is, is it's a very interesting mixture between science and art. It always requires to, to play with the data. So if someone comes to you and tells you, just plug in Facebook profit and, and, and buy houses on that, then you can see the results on certain very famous company that was doing that. Thank you. Um, and very impressive model right here. <laughs> right over here. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, I've got a question regarding the architecture, uh, especially the M beats. Uh, you talked about blocks, like the trend and seasonality and extra genius. Uh, so three blocks. So I'm wondering, are they like separate models kind of uh, stacked together as an ensemble modeling, or they're kind of sequentially chained together? Um, can you elaborate on that? If, uh, we, we can go the, into detail uh, after the talk, but the short answer is they are sequentially uh, stacked. So it's, it's one model that stacks the different layers in, in the architecture, in the end bits and in the end hits. Uh, and obviously in the end hits, I showed you like six different stacks for six different frequencies because we want to be sparse, but you can, you can make the network uh, deeper and have more layers and, and see what comes up. And, and some of those layers are going to be quite interpretable, some uh, intuitively, I mean, and some, some not. But it's, it's, it's the second thing that you said. Hey. Yes, I have a question. So how um, robust are these models to missing data, missing, missing historical data? So one, one, one very interesting thing is many times missing data in time series forecasting is not really missing data. So uh, a lot of CPGs or retailers or e-commerce, when they don't sell anything, instead of writing zero, they just don't include the data. And that's a very classical mistake that people do. Because if you try to interpolate or somehow uh, create the data, you're going to end up with, with uh, a lot of problems. So, uh, always ask your clients or always ask yourself if missing data means zero or if it's actually uh, missing. Uh, that being said, obviously, the models are not magic. So if you have a lot of missing data, the model is going to try to to learn that and it's going to end up producing very bad uh, forecasts. We have seen that uh, for real data, where, where data is noisy, sometimes the best alternative is a very simple autoregressive model like a Croston. And it's going to save you a lot of time, and it's going to perform quite well for sparse uh, time series data. But again, as I was saying before, it's an empirical question. Go, go and test it out. That's, that's the exciting thing. Uh, hi. Thanks for your presentation. Um, have you talked about, I don't know if I missed it or not at the beginning, about sequencing, sequencing your data or slicing your data. And also, I've, I was wondering if you do in, you know, much hyperparameter tuning or if you're using a library for that. Thank you. Sure. In, in the QR that I shared in the collab example of the end hits, uh, we, we show how you can like, do hyperparameter tuning by, by yourself. We have, pre we have offered or, or made available some predefined spaces that we have seen work fine across many data sets. So you don't have to play around a lot. So you can just uh, do the hyperparameter optimization inside that space. And that's going to save you a lot of time. And we also have as a parameter in the different models uh, the cross-validation window. Windows. So you can play around with the different like uh, 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 windows that, that are used to, to train and forecast. So we have time for one more question. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. Like uh, 
Would it be possible to include, like, for instance, some uh, like exogenous exploratory var variables? Like, for instance, let's say you have like uh, your time series is dependent on another time series somehow. There is a relationship. Would it be possible to include it in such a model? It, sure, sure. That's that's a very interesting question, and there are indeed certain multivariate uh, models that uh, try to model also the interaction between the different time series, uh, uh, and and we're developing some of those. We're going to be releasing soon uh, a multivariate uh, uh, NHITS, uh, uh, and there are certain transformer-based uh, models that also do that. That being said, although the uh, NHITS is a univariate model and the NBITS is a univariate model, they many times outperform multivariate uh, models. So uh, the short answer is yes, there is possible to do multivariate uh, things, and we are working on that, and some other people in, in, in the field are also working on that. But again, before you start doing multivariate, try univariate and see if it, uh, it works fine. Good. Thank you very much, Max. Thank you. Really great.